So I guess uh, my name is Geraldine Worry, and I'm a fashion futurist. And uh, I'm, the, I'm an educator. I'm also a designer with a big, long design background before I even went into future trends. And I'm the founder of the Trend Atelier. And so obviously I'm super happy you could join today. I realize, you know, a lot of people are gearing up to go on holiday, especially in the UK or, or have various types of uh, holidays happening at the moment. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to share a little bit about myself, which is that uh, pr previously I led teams in fashion, pr primarily in fashion design. And then I worked as a senior team member of the women's wear team at WGSN in Future Foresight. That was kind of my segue. And then in 2013, I decided to dedicate all of my time to being an independent. It's something I've been thinking about for, for some time, but I had jobs I loved in this sort of corporate fashion world and everything was great, met wonderful people. But by that point, I felt I was ready. And so I dedicated myself to what I call a relational practice. And a relational practice is, is a type of practice that puts interpersonal relationships at the center of its work. So, but today I work with a lot of uh, leading global agencies, innovation agencies, some uh, brands in various markets whether it's uh, innovative sports brands or the luxury brands. And some of you may know also my work within the field of beauty with, with Dazed. And my thoughts are regularly published in leading magazines. And, and I guess um, I think for me, I've, I've placed climate justice and sustainability very much at the center of what I do and um, having a type of focus on social justice as well. I'm a founding member of Fashion Act Now and creativity is also very central to what I do. And I, I regularly do creative collaborations as well, but I'm very passionate about how we can figure out the equation of new ideas, this insatiable curiosity we all share today. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we are sharing all of that today and living within our planetary boundaries. And I've, I've learned over the past year since starting my, my online school that really community was the way. So it started out with the school and then it kind of segued into the community. And it's not just about sharing content really, it's in a community, you know, it's not about, obviously you're there to meet people and you have great exchanges and you learn from others and you share ideas, but it, um, the real fuel is how people come together. And that's kind of the magic, but that's, it's almost hard to define and capture that and, and describe that. But there's something in between those moments of sharing ideas or doing presentations, et cetera. And it has a lot to do with kinship. And that is really what fuels the change from within. And then it spreads out. So today, you're going to discover what we believe is purpose-led future forecasting and how we're designing tools for this as our kind of North Star, our future compass. And I hope it will immediately help you feel like there's a meaningful and sustainable way of approaching newness and Future Trend Foresight as an incubator, of course, for innovation and ideas, but also for, for the greater good. So that's kind of my spiel. Let me know what you think in the chat and if this resonates with you. But um, I'm going to share my screen now. So. So as I share my screen, let me see if I can also have the chat open. Great. So interesting. Everyone. Okay, great. So you know, what is purpose-led forecasting? So years ago, I really felt that my love of future foresight was kind of getting sucked out of me. And I, I started noticing peers and, and as well as students of the trend to the community because of school, I mean, because in the school, we have a lot of experienced forecasters who were going through a type of deep questioning. And, and I felt I had to really listen to that. And 
And I had to go through with getting to the bottom of why cognitively the process of, of sort of um, searching for future trends and always searching for more was not feeling quite right. So, you know, if any of this feels familiar, please share in the chat, or maybe it doesn't, but would love, love to know what, what you think if you felt sometimes sort of slightly drained by the process of always chasing new trends. But I kind of didn't know where to start because I also wanted to create, I also wanted to teach. There's so many different things I wanted to do. So I kind of set out to find a way to, to do it. And so the, the school, the Trend Atelier School was really the starting point where other forecasters started to come together. Because aside from the self-paced courses, we, we meet together once a week, uh, once a month, sorry. And also I started to realize that other people were having the same ideas or, or wanting to focus more on sustainability. And obviously um, at the time, so we started the school in 2019, but I had been forecasting about sustainability and climate change for much longer. Um, but at the time, and as you've seen in the past years, there's been a groundswell of interest in, in how can we find ways within our work to fight climate change, and this type of sense of emergency. And, and I've also seen a groundswell of requests, you know, from journalists, students also. I got regularly got contacted by students who were interviewing me about the negative sides of forecasting that somehow like the future trends industry was contributing to overconsumption and um and the you know the polluting ways that that were um tremendously damaging to our planet so i i also started in terms of semantics noticing how the word trend was getting used with a bad connotation and the press and with experts i actually wrote a piece about that for fashion act now on their on their medium channel and um, so I thought, okay, how can we look at this from a systemic approach and approach that gives tools and um, brings people together in having these conversations, but also something creative. And so it just came through that when I was actually discussing this idea of blending a type of educational and community platform, something where we could really discuss things and trial things, I was discussing this with someone and he was like, you really need to try out this new type of community online platform. And this was during the pandemic and then the community was born. And it's really just the place where we all come together and we all inspire each other around what I've come to call purpose-led forecasting, but you know, it's, it's a title and it's a way and it will show you what it's about. Um, but I think it's had an exponential effect because it's the community that creates that everyone in the community leads that in their own way. And, um, and it's a bit like I compare it to opening your sinuses, you know, it's just like, like I'm breathing, I'm, I'm exchanging. And I think that obviously it would be amazing if we all had a mentor or business coaches, but I think in our own way, you know, not everybody can afford that. Business coaches can be quite costly, although they're incredibly worth it as well. But in a way, we all kind of mentor each other. So it's really about collective power and finding um, convergence, as well as diverse ways of approaching the, the wicked problems that we have today. And more very specifically to future forecasting, you know, we're an industry, we're all about curiosity and getting inspired, but we like our methods, you know? We could, it's considered a soft science, we like, our methods, how do I go about this, the different kinds of research, quantitative, qualitative. But um, I've personally come to learn that a sustainable approach has to have quite a heavy dose of creativity, quite a heavy dose of actually serendipity and really looking at alternative ways. And, um, and, th and ironically, that's how a type of methodology or some kind of blueprint comes to life even though it may seem like it can be a bit unpredictable. So, but for me, I think personally, and I, I'd love to know if, if this resonates with you, I think in future forecasting, sometimes it mimics a bit the news media and just paying lip service to what everyone else is saying. And, and there's, that's a phenomenon and more and more forecasters are, are actually you know, reporting about that and are saying that. Uh, we're all kind of saying the same things. 
Um, so, th but I think also without, you know, obviously everyone's talking about the metaverse and other technological innovations, the changes in healthcare and so many different things, but there's an urgent need when it comes to looking at the reality of the climate science predictions. And I think this is part of what also underpins purpose-led forecasting. So obviously in the community specifically in China today, we're all united in this, but we're all united in an insane level of curiosity as well. <laughs> so the session, that was the intro, but the session schedule is essentially our guiding principles, our approach, um, community meaning experience and thoughts meaning we'll actually have three new community members who are joining us today who share you know how they approach what they think of purpose-led forecasting and then we'll share with you our future plans and and uh, a bonus resource as well so our guiding principles and um you know may, some of you may wonder like what is regenerative thinking it's quite a broad term, it's a popular term, it's often used uh, across sectors from economics to farming. It's often um, included in descriptions around the circular economy or just transition movements, um, but it's not used very consistently and it's often used instead of sustainability or, and obviously people know about it when it comes to farming, that's kind of where it started regenerative um, uh, farming and agriculture. But it also describes mindsets and beliefs and even indigenous uh, traditions. So what do we really mean by regenerative? Um, and um, the Royal Society of the Arts, which I'm a fellow of, um, explains that a regenerative mindset is one that sees the world as built around reciprocal and co-evolutionary relationships where humans, other living beings and ecosystems rely on one another for health and shape and are shaped by their connections with one another. It recognizes that addressing the interconnected social and environmental challenges we face is dependent on rebalancing and restoring these relationships. And so this way of seeing the world is not necessarily new um, it can be seen in, in certain rituals, in certain religions, philosophies, even when you look at cooperatives or, or kibbutz, or there, there are many ways of looking at the collectives in the world. Uh, Christina was saying, yeah, it's the ro uh, Royal Society of the Arts and uh, RSA, known as the RSA. But um, despite this, despite these centuries, in fact, of wisdoms that we have, especially, I think that Susan actually is also a, a fellow, but despite this, the economic and sociopolitical structures um, that we've built, especially over the past century, uh, have been quite extractive and have emphasized a lot on, on, I guess, competition and individualism. And it's important, to reconnect with the fact that we all are all um, interconnected. There's a wonderful um, declaration that you look, can look up online. It's called the Declaration of Interdependence. And it's kind of a reference to the Declaration of Independence in the US. But these are all, just, there are just so many, many references as far as trying to shape an, an equitable future and how everything is connected. So these are um, some references and we'll have links later for you in the resource, but if you wanna look it up, the Royal Society of Arts has recently launched a Regenerative Futures program. And I d discuss it because it's one of the things that we have looked at as a nice reference for how we also build purpose-led forecasting. But they believe that when you use regenerative thinking, it's a fundamental shift in thought and action. And uh, it's going to be critical for people who are interested in social, economic, or environmental change. And this is one of the frameworks um, written in a piece called What Does Regenerative Thinking Mean? That um, states, you know, you start with place and context. These are the different stages uh, that they recommend. 
So this is kind of one way of looking at a kind of framework and a guideline and that there are different models in the Royal Society of the Art, including their living systems and living change approach. And so the living systems perspective is this idea that we are made up of complex living and evolving systems and valuable and value multiple ways of knowing. And um, so in this, in this type of approach, they also reference biomimicry, which is the idea that um, nature is the ultimate intelligence. And Janine Benya said it, in nature's class, not to learn about nature that we might circumvent it or control her, but to learn from nature so that we might fit in it in at last and for good on the earth from which we sprang. So that has actually inspired us in terms of um, philosophies of rewilding. So a lift, living systems, what's interested in it, and just to summarize it, and you'll have access to the link if you wanna go further and, 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 um, and apply this, they even have a living systems framework, but first they see it as nested where something uh, sits within another one, maybe these are larger complex systems with smaller systems that uh, work within each other. And they make the analogy that, uh, for example, British economist Kate Rather, who wrote the Donut Economics uh, book, that every, um, every part of the economy depends on each other and is nested. So for example, if you have a community or a neighborhood that is not doing well because of poverty or because of lack of access to certain resources, the whole system is sick. And it's the same idea that if maybe your heart is sick, your whole body is sick. So everything is interconnected. And third, living systems, and this is really important to our approach, they're emergent. So that means that the different parts are interconnected and in a way unpredictable. And perhaps in hindsight, you can understand how something emerged, but the fact is that you have to be open to the fact that you can't predict everything, that there's some things that will be out of your control, which is actually very, sits quite against our traditional uh, approaches to foresight, which are very often about certainty or certain, certain outcomes. And for the living systems, and this is very key to our approach to purpose-led forecasting is about diversity. And they talk, uh, the RSA talks about reductionism. I, I, I talk about extractivism. So it's this idea that instead, the opposite of favoring diversity would be a system that favors homogeneity or rationalization or just constant efficiency. You're reducing because you the system has to be efficient. So maybe you let go of staff because you wanna be more efficient or how can you reduce costs? You know, a constant better outcome, better efficiency is, is the way that we've built our economies. But if you look at forests, they don't think like that. Uh, they're, they're, they're varied, it's a, it's a biodiversity, the diseases are needed there, parasites are needed there. So it's, it's all one big balance. And then fifth and last, is that, and this is very key to our community approach, is that living systems build mutuality and reciprocity and are founded on relationships um, where we mutually benefit each other, but not in a way that it's like, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, it's something kind of more human-centered and personal, I think. But um, this is based on an article that we found, which we'll also link. Um, which uh, this is bad. I'm getting so caught up in my in my presentation. I'm forgetting to let people in. Uh, but so I'll jump right back onto the slide. But um, so according to Josette Emplau and Emily Amidi, uh, developing the cap capacities and capabilities of regenerative practice is demanding yet rewarding. And I and I love the term they use. They talk about uh, diligence to develop one's effectiveness as a systems actualize, actualizer. And it's a nice term because also in forecasting, we talk a lot about ideas, but how a lot of people are like, okay, great, ideas about this sustainable product or this, but how do I 
we need to change the whole system. This is such a huge uh, challenge. How, how do we do it? You know, and this is, we don't have a straight arrow solution for that, but that's what we're trying to figure out. And so um, far from sort of the business purpose business, which is a nice idea as well, purpose-led business, but it is also a buzzword. And we've been reading about it for years. The Economist wrote about it years ago, um, but it's, it's more about, um, mastering framework thinking and focusing on self-actualizing as well. So uh, increasing your ability uh, to facilitate and draw from certain principles. So perhaps a forecaster could even draw on the principles of biomimicry. Could a forecaster draw on the principles of rewilding? Um, what are the kind of principles that are even outside of our field that we could actually use. And so there's, there's a lot of new potential and tapped, untapped kind of thinking and, and ideas that could lead to action. And uh, so, so, it's not, so there's a potential through this regenerative uh, mindset uh, to address the pressing social and ecological imperatives of our time. And um, so other leading fields, and we'll have links for you in the resource at the end of the presentation are that you can look into our transition design, biomimicry, I, I spoke about syntropic farming. Uh, there's also the, the term regenerative capitalism, which is pot potentially arguable, but I think it's worth exploring. And it's, it's, you have to be open-minded and, and not look at it from a binary way. And capitalism has had its um, I guess, uh, disadvantages we've come to realize, but, but this idea of regenerative capitalism could be worth exploring with the circular, circular design and uh, the circular economy. So now, so we've kind of given you sort of the things, the things out there, a few examples of what inspire us, but there, honestly, there are many more. So we, we wouldn't have enough time, but the thing is that purpose-led forecasting for us really starts with empathy, and that sounds a bit idealistic, but we'll explain it starts with the respect of the individual and with dialogue and transparency and seeing that every interaction matters and is considered. And so it's about taking the time, which is actually sometimes counterintuitive in a field where it's all about innovation, you know, what's next, what's new. And so we're trying to challenge how we future forecast and design for a changing world. And, and we believe in thinking in big picture and in systems and not just trends. And um, I'm going to read from you actually what our, um, our values are. So we have a space in the community called community values. So when you arrive in the community, there's a space that you can start and sort of read about all of our community values. But so this, these are our beliefs. We want to facilitate a kind, powerful, humble, and safe community space. So we have to agree from the get-go on some ground principles, values that foster and fuel the culture around how we show up here and relate to one another. By striving to embody these values in our community, we aim to create an exceptional space for future experts, creatives, and a diverse set of future curious, future conscious people to connect. So uh, our first is take part in creating a preferable future. That's our first value. By joining this community, you have already activated this point. We as a community are committed to working towards the greater good of the planet and the people through our future forecasting practice and other activities we may have already uh, developed or are developing. Take seriously your power as a future trends research, analysis, and forecasting expert as a designer as you are a force of influence for people, brands, and organizations. Empower the change of outdated systems hurting our planet, our social welfare, and future generations by sharing here in this space and growing with us because we want to build resilience and knowledge in order to make powerful decision. And we are here to empower purposeful future forecasting. So does this resonate with anyone here? I hope um, I'm seeing a lot of really serious faces. I hope this isn't like super intimidating. So like, let us know if you, if this really resonates with you. 
um, cheer us on. But the next one is abundance mindset. So here we believe that everyone and every business is unique. What others might see as competition is an opportunity for partnership and learning. In the industry of future forecasting and the style industry, which is the one I come from, there is a lot of competition, a lot of copying as well. So in this community, we encourage a landscape of support, sharing, and respect of other people's work. Be open, not secretive. Be collaborative, not competitive. Be regenerative, not extractive. This is why we have a space dedicated to abundance where we share a multitude of resources and ideas very openly and in a safe space. So we actually do have a space that is titled Abundant Mindset. Then we talk about um, collaboration. Individually, we are great, but collectively, we thrive. Only through collaboration and engaging in collaboration culture, we succeed in working and creating a better future and move away from an extractive culture. Community is the future, collaborating is the future, and as humans, we are social creatures. Let's foster a collaborative spirit in the community. It's not necessarily about pushing your services, it's about having authentic connections and meeting kindred spirits and hopefully forming rich collaborations. Our next one is question the surface of everything. As a community of future curious minds, creatives, designers, and forecasters, we strongly encourage a space where we share thought-provoking ideas around positive change and what is at the forefront of innovation. Um, therefore, we encourage you to question the surface of everything, avoid surface engagement, hype, and groupthink, enable a critical understanding of the issues at play in the world, and be open to unlearning and new ideas. Our next one is be kind and uh, use only constructive dialogue. So we have like a few little guidelines about how we speak to each other. I'll, I'll speed up just to, for time's sake, but our sixth one is embody a positive solution focused way of thinking. And um, the next one I will go gr in greater detail, which I think is really important. It's about being yourself. Many people in the community are introverts. Some of us are neurodiverse. So some of us go through very busy times or are busy parents. And uh, luckily the way the community is designed is actually quite friendly for neurodivergent people. Um, but there is space for anyone in whichever way they want to deal with the community. And our values are to give you deep value. And um, so, but you know, we totally, we don't, we don't allow FOMO, like there's no FOMO. People can always catch up. There's always replays. There's different ways of interacting. This idea that you have to post and comment and like everything is completely overrated. And so, and then our last value is great ideas for action-oriented future curious minds. This community is a place for you to understand the full arc of researching and forecasting trends, to harness the power of futuring, to create a better world and spread a positive sphere of knowledge and um, influence. So this was kind of important to me to talk you through these because this is embed, embeds sort of the, the starting point of when people arrive and what they're greeted with. But in a very pragmatic way, in terms of the framework, um, obviously we have the future foresight presentations that we run quarterly. These are big favorites and they act like a spark, a burst of knowledge, a place of deeper intellectual and like stimulation of curiosity. And hopefully you can join us next week on the 19th. We're presenting our care futures presentation, uh, our future vision presentation. And we'll employ some speculative techniques for this one. We've actually never, quite done it like that before. So we're really excited to share you, uh, share with you. Um, so obviously it helps to have the, that sort of boost of inspiration and, and insights. But for example, we actually have tools and we have a space called Foresight Tools. So last session, I shared the Create Your Mission Statement. Um, we have also, we're, I'm about to finalize a tool called How to Think and Do Regenerative Forecasting. These are some examples. We have also a model on the Syntropic Forecasting model. I'll talk about this next. We also uh, discussed speculative design. We have a session about that with Tina Gorjank. 
And um, we've even had a session with ACID. So we've looked at also tarot cards as a way to really harness creativity. So we have a diversity of methods. Some are kind of write your mission statement, put it down. This, these are frameworks for uh, regenerative forecasting. This is a framework for uh, creating a, a report following the syntropic farming model, but we also have some like creative exercises, such as speculative design or, or tarot card kind of goes into tapping more of the intuitive forecasting aspect of our work. And then we also have tools that really address very practical needs because obviously it's about supporting the day-to-day. -day. So we have the growth path, a uh, tech toolbox that we also recently released that members were like, this is exactly what I needed, you know, from uh, how to collect all your research to how to run webinars. Like I have, house, I have such a huge library of resources. So we actually created a resource for that. We're also finalizing the feedback blueprint, which is how we show up in asking feedback and receiving feedback. We're finalizing this and um, this will be actually, uh, this has the feedback blueprint has been a very collaborative effort. We also have a tool for writing for future forecasters and we're going to have a journalist who writes about future trends who will also talk to us about this in June. And we also hosted a workshop with the Happy Startup School called Why You're Not Getting Paid What You're Worth because a lot of our members actually struggle with asking for what they're worth when it comes to getting paid for their services. And so these are the things that we're discussing and that um, I think will probably inform some kind of tool uh, because we're really interested in questioning metrics. Uh, we often discuss, you know, what's the metric or validity of a new trend? Is it urgent? Does it promote um, rather, whether, rather than it being new, is it Urgent. So these are sort of a different way of doing a diffusion of innovation theory type of thing. And so those are conversations we're having right now. And the thing is that we're listening. We're listening to our members. We're listening to the conversation. We're taking notes. So I think that these types of new standards could pr probably inform a tool in the near future. And, but in terms of new metrics, part of, for example, what we talked about in our regenerative forecasting session that we had, I think it was three weeks ago, we're also even like, do you approach purpose-like forecasting, not just in how um, you're, the trends that you want to, to focus on, but also in how you want to be treated or who you want to work with, uh, the clients you want to work with, how do you approach that? That can be really, really tricky. Um, you know, what are your metrics for perhaps the type of work you want to engage with? Uh, and how can you evolve your relationships in a way that works really well for you? Um, so I'm just going to go quickly over a few examples and then we'll have our guests. But here are just a few actual examples. So this is our growth path. So this is a tool that greets our members. Because one thing I learned as a community, a student of community, which I feel um, now I'm going to be studying this for a long time, but is to have some kind of measuring tool. Because in the community, we have a lot of seasoned experts. We also have people who are kind of starting out on their journey. We have some people who are still honing the way they, they research or feel, don't feel very confident, for, for example, in writing. And then we also have members who are, have podcasts our public speaking, our hosting conferences. So it's quite a broad spectrum. And so uh, when, we, when we put out a new tool, we guide our members in letting them know at what stage this will help them with. And this isn't, the growth path is not something that um, members have to use. It's just helpful for some pe people who want to feel like they have like an educational a bit like a course, like what's, how do I know when I've kind of like made some progress in some of the things I'm trying to achieve? Um, so I was talking about the syntropic farming model. So we actually studied the syntropic farming model and it's very much based on energy dissipation. And so we then created a flower model for a future trend report. Like 
what could a future trend report structure look like if it was using citropic farming models? So it could have the introduction, perhaps by the numbers, because there is a section in uh, forecasting which is about the, the mental. So we thought, okay, maybe that's like you start with the report, you do want some data. Then uh, the next chapter would have to focus on the people, the planet, prosperity, methodology, conclusion. So this was a, just an idea we threw out. Where this is an experimental project, but we're trying to think of like new ways of, of structuring our thoughts. And, uh, and some of our members go back to this tool over and over again and, and really love it actually, because they, they've, they found it really inspiring and it's kind of changed their whole um, approach really to, to, to uh, how they could pot potentially create a forecast. When it came to rewilding, which was our very first theme in the community when we jump started a year ago, um, we looked at rewilding. We took, talked also a lot about um, certainty. Rewilding is about giving control back to nature and st stop, stopping feeling the need to control everything. So we thought, how could we model this with in terms of future trend forecasting, what would future trend forecasting look like if we gave control back to nature? Is it a forecasting process that is more communal and ongoing and interconnected? Is it trends that aren't wasteful because there's no waste in nature? Or is it, you know, is it about focusing on future foresight that is not about a set prediction? So, and then this is the piece of um, the resource we shared last last week, uh, with, no, sorry, this Monday, which was very helpful for, for, for our members in terms of writing their mission. So for our members, this is important because it gives them clarity. It actually takes time to write your mission. It's actually a quite a difficult uh, task, but after that, it's really great because you can use it on your bio or in so many different ways. So, um, and then, we did also our session on how to think and do regenerative forecasting. So this is our next um, downloadable tool. We have one downloadable tool a month. And I just wanted to run by this with you. Like we, I, I, I saw somewhere this really cool tool. It was called the uh, Regenerative Futures Audit. Uh, sorry, it was, um, it was an audit. It was a community leader that was saying, how do you check how you're creating culture in your community. And he created this tool called the culture audit. So I thought, what if we had a regenerative futures audit? And so this, these were like different points we asked ourselves in terms of auditing ourselves. And um, these are in terms of active learning and creativity, which is fundamental in purpose-led forecasting. It's about exchange and community. We also do a lot on Miro boards. Um, so you can see all the post-it notes these are the mirror boards from different events. I've just picked one, uh, but we have these types of activities. And to the bottom left, it's the AI cards of tech. And we picked a few different cards to try and like play a card game in terms of how we forecast and how we engage with creating new ideas and generating new ways of approaching foresight. And so, for us, the formula is really about a diverse and fluid approach, emergence, diversity, and being experimental. But the fact is that it is making an impact in terms of people meeting and interviewing each other for podcasts, doing research work together, doing teaching work together, um, speak, you know, speaking work together, or start developing projects. Uh, there's a, a number of things that are happening in the community. So this, this is all of this thinking, all of this experimentation is leading to something great. So I just want to end with, um, with uh, our speakers today, our guest speakers who are members of the community. And then if you could just stay with me at the end for four minutes so that I can share the link with you of our resource and I show that I could tell you also a little bit about what we have planned for uh, for the rest of the year. So we'll start with Rumi. I'd like to introduce Rumi, who's an amazing um, 
forecaster or artist, Rumi, I'm going to pin you uh, so that you're center. And um, I will, I guess, you know, let you take the, can you tell us, you know, about your views on purpose-side foresight and just a bit about yourself? Yeah. So can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my, yeah, my name's Rumi. Um, I'm uh, I'm I, I'm from London. I'm uh, a trend forecaster currently at Media Arts Lab, which is the singular uh, and dedicated trend forecasting agency for Apple computing across all their products, from the MacBook to iPhone, uh, Apple Watch, uh, and including things like uh, Apple TV and Apple Pay. Um, so my focus um, is on tech technology, sort of media and technology. Um, but actually, um, my work with Geraldine has prefigured that in, in some ways, because that focus on media and technology was happening um, before then. Uh, and I think that this is becoming more and more important. Um, some of Geraldine's talks about the metaverse and Web3 um, have re prefigured this idea that I think that the tech is going to take a center stage. So, uh, so what does purpose mean for me in, in, this, um, in this context of, of, of tech? Well, like I think tech is going through this massive uh, renaissance at the moment. We're seeing the development of an entirely new internet, um, this thing called Web 3.0 or Web 3, um, which uh, Web 3, which is essentially a new kind of internet structure, which allows for uh, new activity, new behaviours, um, such as setting up uh, a decentralised community. Um, uh, but interestingly, a lot of people claim that Web 3 doesn't really exist um, and what they mean by that is there's nothing I mean you can set up a decentralized system now in web 2 if you want to there's, there's in, in some ways there's nothing you can't do in web 3 um, that you can't in some ways do at the moment um, so what's what's the fundamental difference between web 2 and web 3 I would say that it's the fundamental difference is that web three um, is built in opposition to the hierarchical structures that have emerged from web two, um, such as Facebook and Google, this hierarchical, stacked, vertical, top-down structure um, that is very much like a neo-feudal uh, structure with lords um, and, uh, and, and land barons at the top, uh, the king at the very top, and then these serfs um, who essentially own nothing but have to um, enter the baron or the lord's land and live uh, off it, um, grow their vegetables on it, uh, and if they're kicked off that land they have, they have nothing. Um, in a sort of hyper accelerated capitalist structure this this is essentially um, terrifying <laughs> as a as a model to build uh, anything with um, and, it, and and so inevitably there had to be some form of like resistance again against, against this that's what web 3 really is um, so it's based on the blockchain which is a distributed network so imagine those serfs uh, who own nothing getting together um, and uh, deciding that they will share their resources, share their land, uh, and completely cut out their need to interact with any lord or baron. Um, it, when you see it in that context, it's almost like a, a, a political form of resistance. And actually, that's what I think it, it, it is, exactly. Um, it's uh, Web3 is actually um, a model for how uh, to structure the internet um, as a whole. Um, and it's kind of interesting. Um, so that model, that, that base architecture, that um, the, those foundationary structures of this new internet come from 
um, Satoshi Nakamoto, who was a pseudonym. Satoshi Nakamoto might be uh, one person, it might be a group of people, um, but Nakamoto published the Bitcoin white paper in 2008, which is instructions on how to build um, the, the, uh, the blockchain, uh, whichever, which this new internet is based on. And um, he says, um, it's, it's instructions on how to create a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash that would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through financial institutions. Um, and I think this is really important. And when he published the white paper, um, a fascinating thing happened. There was um, this, uh, this talk on, um, Yeah, it says here, uh, in a fascinating thread on uh, bitcointalk.org, um, reproduced in um, uh, the book by uh, Mike uh, Golgoski, um, one person wrote, screw big business. Google, Microsoft, Walmart can all eat flaming death as far as I'm concerned. Where systems like Bitcoin can be uh, useful is in making both government and big business irrelevant and obsolete. So from its very start, there is this, um, there is res there's, there's complete resistance to old structures, old government, um, old institutions. Um, and so, and we're seeing this play out now. Um, so we're, we almost live in an interregnum, um, a time where something massive um, is about to happen. Uh, there's a there's a there's a battle taking place between huge players like uh, Facebook and Google, who the, the potential uh, is that they will they will become like immediately obsolete, or maybe they already are. Maybe they're absolute husks uh, of a, of a thing. Maybe they mean nothing anymore because of this new Web three internet. Maybe they're already dead. Um, but we also see examples from Facebook where it's trying to re reclaim its complete control um, over this system. It, it owns Oculus Rift. If you want to be in the internet, maybe you'll have to buy their hardware. So they're trying to, to gain um, this top-down control again. And there are these um, radical actors from the bottom trying to resist that. And we don't know how this is going to play out yet. Um, we, uh, we're we seeing it um, unfold before us almost on a daily basis, something new is take, taking place. And us as trend forecasters, um, we, have, we're, we have this responsibility, we are in the midst of this change. Um, and our decisions, our advice, um, and our actions will, um, will determine the way that this enormously important thing plays out um, yeah. it's all about uh about uh, power thank you so much Rumi. that was really interesting and i love your point of view and you know we all have different ideas around web3 in the community and it's really great to to have yours um thank you everyone put questions in the chat and you know um we'll have our q a next next week so I'm just going to pass the mic. Thanks so much, uh, Rumi. That was great. People are commenting in the, in the chat. Um, but I'm, I'm going to pass on to uh, Monica. And then... If Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Monica, um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, but Monica is also in the community and has been really, really inspiring and contributed to events as well. Um, and I just want to say, I think we're going to go over time a little bit. So if you don't mind staying with us for just 10 extra minutes, we really, really appreciate it just to give our guests enough time to introduce themselves. And then I just want to share the link to the resources that we made for you, especially today. Um, so, so um, yes, uh, Monica, go ahead. Please. Let's change his mind. <laughs> so. Hi everyone, I'm talking with you from Vilnius in Lithuania and uh, I started uh, my career as a fashion designer. I worked as a designer for six years 
and I work closely with manufacturing companies because Lithuania is really strong in that. And in that experience, uh, at the end of uh, my fashion designer official career, I was really disappointed in grown-ups because, uh, you know, every strategic session we sit uh, around the table, well, we talk about all the big ideas and we agree, yeah, old uh, thinking is uh, not for us. Let's do, you know, let's be sustainable, all the buzzwords you can hear. And then we move into action. And in that stage, we come to the old way because that's how it goes. So I, was, I started questioning, where does that start? And one thing led to another. I got an opportunity to work in education. And now this is where I am. So kind of, you know, when I think like how I came from designer uh, to someone who works in education, uh, then I reflect on that. I understand that, you know, I really felt that I need to see the route where those grown-ups are produced. So education system. And uh, I started each design. It was really interesting uh, way of uh, even rediscovering what design is. Because, you know, then you have to explain that to sixth grader. Uh, you have to really <laughs> know how to do that and uh, be a very uh, basic language uh, and uh, all, all that. But uh, when I was teaching, I understood that, oh my God, this young generation are learning the same way as I was, my parents, my grandparents. Uh, they are only surrounded by better technology, more resources, but the way, like teacher is standing, class is listening, and four to five minutes, you go to the next one. So uh, I thought, what are other ways? And I found a future school, which is uh, working today, <laughs> in real life today. And I became a student mentor because in school where I work now, there are no teachers. Where are tutors, facilitators, and student mentors? So totally different approach. There are no classical lessons, you know, where you have 30 kids in one room and teacher is teaching a lesson. Uh, the school where I work, we are focusing on individual approach. So, you know, we are saying that every kid is like a new school because where they are, that's the most important thing. And we have only three values, which we're aligning with my own values. It's trust, it's no stress, and it's time. And you know, when I think uh, about this route, which is education, it really resonates uh, with purpose led -like forecasting because this is exactly uh, what my view is on, on what is purpose led -like forecasting. So I don't believe, you know, in perfect, on setting the perfect stage because usually uh, our old way forecasting uh, is, oh, these are big ideas. This is the, in the perfect uh, world, this uh, would work. But you know, world is changing. And uh, I think individual needs needs to be met. So tailoring solutions, tailoring uh, forecasts uh, for specific company, because you know, one company is on level one, another company is on level fifth. You can't give the same thing for them. You have to address their needs. So this is, yeah, this is how I look in purpose led forecasting. Because I think as a forecasters and even as a designers, you know, you have to learn to look around to find the molecules and connect uh, those molecules for the specific need, for the specific company or person or, uh, organization and uh, one of the values uh, which uh, I got to practice in the, the school where I work currently is non-judgmental curiosity because you know then you uh, forget uh, all the judgmental things you can see different perspectives and then you see different perspectives you can connect them and something new might, might happen Thank yeah, you so, so much. This is where this is where I am. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Monica. Yeah, we talk about molecules in the school also in the way we structure the the, the trends and, and also our, I, I love that you work with children. That's such a big thing. And we talked about this factory model in the education in last year in, in our the month we covered education. And uh, for whoever decides to join the community, everything is available, everything we've done so far uh, from day one. But I want to introduce now, thank you so much, Monica, that was great. Thank I you. think you have a question from Christina in the chat, but I want to introduce Susan now, who's an amazing, um, fascinating, I don't know how to even describe you, because you're like kind of like a, a, a polymath. I'll let you introduce yourself. Can you hear? Yeah. Oh, we can't hear you. I think you might be muted. Hi, I'm Susan. I'm a writer, trend forecaster, and a slow fashion entrepreneur, and I'm based in London. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say how very much I enjoy being a part of the Trend Atelier community, and uh, particularly the talks. And uh, when we have our intimate sessions, it's so much fun because we go seriously off piste and we talk about all manner of different things. And it's just terribly inspiring. And uh, there's also masses of material on the on the website and uh, in the course modules. So I can just highly recommend it on all counts. Um, you can also find out about all the members through their bios. So you can read up about my background if you'd like to know. And um, I've actually also uh, written an article on Geraldine's site on dress codes, because uh, what not many people know is that years ago, I used to be a power dressing investment manager in the city, but that's in the past. And um, purpose-led forecasting has been a part of my work for quite a long time. Um, so what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about my um, experience in slow fashion and sustainable design before providing a little sort of unusual example of purpose-led forecasting. Uh, initially, I wasn't that great a fan of the term trend forecasting. And so I created my own word, um, visuology, which is a combination of vision, intuition, and sociology to describe my approach. And for some years, I edited my own visuology magazine. And uh, um, it, it's all about style beyond trends. So looking at inspiration and ideas for a sustainable future, because who says trends need to be changing all the time? I'm a big proponent of slow style. And I'm really happy to see that people are finally catching on to this concept. A commitment to slow and handcrafted fashion and design has always been central to my forecasting. In the 1990s, I had an in real life boutique where I was selling vintage and upcycled clothing. And I love that one of the values in the Trend Atelier Charter is curiosity. And, and you've said so much about it today, Geraldine, um, because mo like most trend forecasters, I've always been curious about everything. And in fact, my current online store, which I set up in 2008, is called Shop Curious. I've just created a small collection of clothing made in London from recycled and dead stock fabrics, which I'll be launching shortly on my website. And this is an example I'm wearing today. Um, but <laughs> back to the um, purpose-led forecasting. One of the things I'm fascinated by um, is the idea of legacy and digital immortality. And around 15 years ago, I wrote a book exploring those topics, among others, called Trends Beyond Life in Search of Immortality. As a freelancer, writer and forecaster, one of my first clients was a cemetery owner who set up remembrance parks in the UK and Africa. And he was a proponent of natural burials and shared my concern about ways of sustainably or maybe in a circular way, disposing of bodies. And now in, in the light of, of COVID and everything that's going on in the world, I wonder how we can make the disposal of bodies both respectful and regenerative. This is an ongoing area of research for me. And I'm especially inspired by projects like there's a recent venture by graduates from the Royal College of Art who have developed a way to create artificial reefs for growing oysters using underwater urns made from human ashes. The concept of remembrance and being remembered have also influenced my work. In the early 2000s, 
I set up a digital time capsule where people could record memories of deceased um, friends and members of their family for future generations. And this became an add-on service, which my cemetery owning client could offer the bereaved. And I, I guess this sort of platform has been superseded by the likes of Facebook but just imagine the online memorial space that there'll be in the metaverse. This is another area that you know, we're all currently focusing on. Um, and there's a venture called Remember Metaverse, which claims to be, although, although it isn't, the world's first virtual cemetery where you can buy land, build memorial halls and purchase memorial stone NFTs. Um, I'm really intrigued by the opportunities presented by this whole new dimension, but I don't believe that our online presence, our avatar or digital twin will live forever. To sum up, the main purpose embedded in my work is to explore ways whereby we can make a lasting positive difference beyond our limited existence on this planet. So I'd love to hear from you. If you have any suggestions, please message me or share your ideas with the community. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. That was great. I've put all your um, infos in the chat. Um, everyone, Susan is such a pioneer in, um, in our field, really, and is incredibly modest, but she's always talked about things way before others did, and I'm always in incredibly impressed by that. Um, so I'm just going to quickly wrap it up to share with you the things that we're working on to really manifest uh, purpose-led forecasting. And so we're going, we've decided collectively that we want to work on a report together this year. And this will be in the fall because it requires time and preparation because the way we wanna do it is like a journey. It's not just about creating a report, it's about how we'll work together on it, how we'll write it together. And it's really, although we opened a year ago, people who will join us will be part of creating essentially a blueprint of how we might work in the years to come until we change it again, because you know we, we're creatives, let's face it. Um, but basically I'm really excited about that. It's gonna be quite a commitment, but we're going to send out a survey and see who wants to, uh, to join. And that's partially why we've planned this trend writer to come in on um, uh, in June because we know for a fact that quite a few of our members uh, struggle a little bit with the trend writing, um, even the very confident ones. Uh, for some reason, it's 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 a it can be a, a friction point. The feedback support uh, it was assessed in our surveys that people want feedback, yet they struggle to ask for feedback. It's quite intimidating. So we're creating a whole sort of feedback environment. We have a space for, for that, but it wasn't good enough to actually have a space we're really trying to create. So we've had member meetings where we've agreed on how we wanna show up for the feedback. We're also, we haven't done it yet, but I'm planning on these types of uh, questionnaires where people will put forward who they wanna see in the community as a guest, but also perhaps what kind of events they might want to host. And we encourage our members to lead events that might also be a type of testing ground for something that they want to develop. And then finally, this is something we've talked about for a year and we've never really quite had the time to do it, but it's still on people's minds and people still wanna do it, which is this idea of heroes. And we've been wanting to, either through member-led events, or we're not quite sure how it will publish. So I think this is gonna take a bit more time, but we wanna talk about the future nurses see, children, farmers, you know, different types of workers, people completely outside of our fields and give them um, the mic basically. And um, yeah, so this is the bonus resource that we created for you. So if you wanna, copy that link or scan it. And essentially what it is is a PDF uh, on Dropbox that you can download with a number of links for some of the resources that we shared today, but also other resources that will hopefully inspire you around regenerative uh, thinking and purpose, just a few examples. Uh, there's a ton of information out there around purpose-led business. So we focus more on regenerative mindsets that 
Um, I'm going to just check in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for joining. And sorry we went slightly over time, but it was amazing to have you. I'm going to stop sharing the screen, and um, and. Uh,